Welcome to the book of Deuteronomy, the Hebrew Ella Hadevarim, which means these are the words, and that's exactly how the book begins. And again, we get the name Deuteronomy from the Greek translation of the Old Testament, Deuteros second nomos law or second law uh, that is based off of Deuteronomy 17, 18, and the idea that the task of the king was to make a copy of the law. So the title, uh, second law, we could perhaps misunderstand that because Deuteronomy isn't giving us a second law, it's giving us an expansion and an organization of the law. Uh, who wrote it? Once again, uh, we have Moses, and there are several verses that hint at Moses being the author, some of which speak of Moses writing the law or explaining the law. Uh, for example, Deuteronomy 31, 22 to 26, when Moses had finished writing the words of the law in the book to the very end, Moses commanded the Levites who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, take this book of the law and put it by the side of the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, that it may be there a witness uh, for you. There are also numerous references to the Old Testament or in the Old Testament to the law of Moses. And in the New Testament, we have references to quotes from uh, Deuteronomy being attributed to Moses. For example, Mark chapter 10 and verse 3, what did Moses command you? And the Pharisees respond with a quotation from Deuteronomy 24 regarding divorce. Uh, they understood that it was from Moses. In Romans 10, 19, uh, Paul writes, Moses says, and he follows that with a quote from Deuteronomy 32. So Moses wrote the book, although it uh, is likely that Joshua perhaps uh, wrote the 34th chapter, uh, the record of the death of Moses. What then is the date of the writing? Well, the book's written just before the death of Moses and just before the people enter over into the promised land. It's the end of the wilderness journey. So the vast majority of the book is Moses addressing the people of Israel in the plains of Moab at the very end of the wilderness journey. And again, Moab is east of the Jordan River, right along the other side of the Dead Sea. And uh, it's the area of South Canaan, uh, but now the people are east of that river. They haven't yet crossed over uh, into Canaan. The book opens with a bit of a review in Deuteronomy 1, 5 through 7, you see that, and it's going back to their time in Sinai, also known as Mount Horeb. Um, and most of the book's contents, though, aren't by, around Mount Sinai, but take place in those plains of Moab. But that helps us fix a date then of around 1405 BC. And knowing the date, again, helps us to understand the historical context of the book. Deuteronomy is a covenant renewal document. It provides a history of Israel and a renewal of the covenant. And the book is, is largely a record of speeches that Moses makes, the ones that he makes at the end of his life as the people are getting ready to enter the land of promise. Moses is delivering his address to a new generation of Israelites. And it's important to remember that. Now, because of the rebellion that we saw in Numbers chapter 14, where the children of Israel refuse to enter the land, but instead they begin to grumble against God, God judges them. Uh, they are condemned to a wilderness journey of 40 years, and that generation is condemned to die. Now, we might ask, well, who exactly dies as a result of that rebellion? Who was about to cross over into the promised land. So who died and who remained that are crossing over? On the one hand, Numbers 14 seems to indicate that all of the men who rebelled would die, and it becomes more explicit in Numbers 14, 29. Your dead bodies shall fall in this wilderness, and all of your number listed in the census from 20 years old and upward who have grumbled against me. And then in 14, 31, and 32, but your little ones who you said would become a prey, I will bring in, and they shall know the land that you've rejected. But as for you, your dead bodies will fall in this wilderness. So it's the people over 20 who are about to, who survive and are about to enter the land of promise. But what people, uh, or just people 
It is the people over 20 who die as a result of judgment and their bodies will lie in the wilderness. But what people? Is it only the rebellious? Well, that's the implication. Uh, is it just the men? And that's another implication. In Numbers 1, 47 through 49, gives us another implication that some of the Levites may not have died in the wilderness. They're explicitly excluded from the census in Numbers 1. They were not among those who were supposed to go to war uh, several times in the book of Numbers. We're told Levites are separate from the congregation of Israel. So perhaps those who died in the wilderness specifically because of that judgment against them, maybe it didn't include the Levites. And that that would explain how Eleazar takes Aaron's place, and it's clear from the book of Joshua that he does make it into the land of promise. In the book of Deuteronomy, Moses also makes reference to at least a, a good portion of those standing before Moses who were eyewitnesses to the delivery from Egypt. And you can see that in Deuteronomy 4, 34 and 29, 2 and 3. Um, maybe at the time they were just teenagers. It ends up being a pretty big study topic, but I believe we can conclude that those who fell could possibly be restricted only to those fighting men who refused to go into Canaan in Numbers 13 and instead rebelled against God. I think it's possible, but in any case, What's happening here on the cusp of entering into the promised land is that Moses is addressing a new generation, however many of the old uh, survive. So what's happening here is covenant renewal. So with covenant renewal in mind as part of the historical context, I want to take a few moments and observe how the book of Deuteronomy is arranged according to a covenant structure. And this is, again, another complex topic. It could take a series of classes uh, to cover. But to to suffice it to say, Deuteronomy is arranged according to a particular covenant structure. Now, how would we define a covenant? Uh, there are various ways that you can define it, uh, but I think the most helpful uh, that I found is defined by Meredith Klein on page four of Kingdom Pro Prologue, where he defines a covenant as primarily a legal disposition characteristically established by oath and defined by the terms specified in oath-bound, divinely sanctioned commitments. And that's what we see. Uh, throughout Deuteronomy. Now, numerous scholars have observed a close parallel uh, between the structure of biblical covenants and the arrangement of covenants that were prominent in ancient Near Eastern alliances, particularly in the Hittite treaties of the third and fourth centuries BC. And in these treaties, you would have a ruler who would address his vassal and those covenants that he would make with them would regulate uh, their relationship. Uh, Klein's structure of biblical authority is very uh, helpful here, and he also uh, walks through the parts of a covenant. And the treaties uh, consisted typically of six parts. You would have a preamble in which the ruler or the king, the suzerain, declares who he is, uh, what his titles are. Uh, you see this in Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God. You see it in the Ten Commandments, I am Yahweh, your Elohim. The second section would be an historical prologue, and that's where the deeds of that ruler are listed. This is what he has done. All of the relationships that he's had are, are revealed to the people. You see, this is well in Genesis. In the beginning, God, he created. You see it in the Ten Commandments. I am the Lord your God. And what did he do? He brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. And then we see covenant stipulations in these treaties. And this is the laws that the king would impose upon the parties. And in Genesis 1, we see the same thing. We see the commands then, the command to creation, uh, particularly the command that's given to Adam to guard and keep uh, the garden temple, not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We see it in the Ten Commandments, of course, the stipulations that are, law, that are there in the law. And then next we would see the particular uh, conditions of the treaty or what would be necessary uh, for the preservation, the conveyance of uh, the treaty, such as the regular 
regular reading of the treaty, the posting of the treaty, reading uh, the Word of God in the temple. In Genesis, we see the propagation of the creation pattern in, in Revelation. Adam clearly didn't fulfill the covenant condition here. He didn't convey this information to Eve, or at the very least, he stood by and watches Eve as she demonstrates her ignorance of the covenant stipulations. In Deuteronomy, we see the propagation of the covenant found in the command to read the covenant, such as Deuteronomy 31, 10, and 11. Moses commanded them at the end of every seven years, at the set time in the year of release, at the Feast of Booths, when all Israel comes to appear before the Lord your God at the place that he will choose, you shall read this law before all Israel in their hearing. And afterward, he read all the words of the law, the blessing and the curse according to all that is written in the book of the law. So there was conditions for the preservation of the covenant. And then the fifth section were, was the uh, witnesses clause, or the calling of witnesses to the treaty. In Genesis, you see it in the Holy Spirit, a witness to creation in the Ten Commandments. The people are called to witness, but particularly the Ark of the Covenant is a witness to the commandments as they are placed within it. And then finally, the sanctions section of the covenant structure. And that's the promise of blessing for obedience, of cursing for disobedience. You see that as well in Genesis, the warning that is given to Adam that he will surely die or die, die is the way that it's put. Uh, if you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, then the promise of life uh, that if he successfully completes that probation. In Deuteronomy, you see it in the blessings and cursings. Uh, specifically, you see it in the law and the Ten Commandments in the promise that's given in the Fifth Commandment. And this covenantal arrangement can be seen in Genesis, in Exodus. We find a similar arrangement in the book of Matthew. Matthew follows a, a covenantal structure, and that's interesting because Matthew kind of follows the Pentateuch in the way that it's arranged. You have a Genesis section, the beginning of Christ's ministry. You have an Exodus section. We touched on that when we were in the book of Exodus. You have a Leviticus section, the law of Christ, a Deuteronomy section, beginning of chapter 24, Christ preaching at the temple and leading his people to a promised land. Take he takes his disciples to the mountain and he teaches them and he tells them to go and conquer, uh, baptize and teach the nations. Um, other books, of course, demonstrate this covenant structure, some more so, some less so. Uh, the books of the kings seem to have been influenced by the laws of Deuteronomy. You can particularly see that in the reforms of Josiah. In our course in Zephaniah, if you take that course, you can see that as well. We discuss how that book is arranged according to a, a covenantal structure. Now, I've already mentioned how, how the Ten Commandments are arranged in that covenantal structure, but Deuteronomy as an entire book can be seen to be arranged in this covenantal structure, probably more explicitly than any other book of the Bible. In his Treaty of the Great King, which is titled Covenant Structure of Deuteronomy, uh, Meredith Klein presents a structure that's, that's very similar to the one uh, that we're about to see here. And that is in Deuteronomy, you see a preamble in verses 1 through 5. Uh, God announces himself, and he does so, as we've seen, uh, through the mediation of Moses. We see an historical prologue from 1 6 to 443 uh, in Deuteronomy 10. Or Deuteronomy 1 and verse 10, we read, The Lord your God has multiplied you. This is what I've done for you. And behold, you are today numerous as the stars of the heavens. We see the stipulation section. That's a large part of the book from 444 to 2619. All throughout this section, there's the giving of the law. So this is what I've done for you. Here's who I am, what I've done for you. And now here is what I require. Uh, for example, Deuteronomy 23, 21. If you make a vow to the Lord your God, you shall not delay in fulfilling it, for the Lord your God will surely require it of you, and you'll be guilty of sin. And then the conditions or the continuity of the text. 
uh, you see that in various passages in Deuteronomy, particularly in chapters 31 to 34. Uh, we saw one from chapter 31 a few moments ago, uh, Moses reading the words of the law. Uh, you see another one in 6, uh, 5 through 9, after the Shema or the confession of faith, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. And we read after that, that all these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and so on. This is covenant continuity, uh, covenant conveyance to the next generation. And you see this kind of language in several other places, uh, notably in chapter 27, where Moses says, keep the whole commandment that I command you today, and on the day that you cross over Jordan to the land that the Lord your God is giving you, you shall set up large stones and plaster them with plaster, and you shall write on them all the words of this law when you cross over to enter the land that the Lord your God is giving you. And then next would be the covenant witnesses section of Deuteronomy. And again, ancient Near Eastern treaties would have this witness section, but they would often call upon the name of the pagan gods to witness the treaty that they are about to make. Well, you don't do that in the book of Deuteronomy. Instead, God calls heaven and earth as witnesses to the covenant that he's making. And that's actually mentioned three different spots in the book of Deuteronomy. In chapter 4, in chapters 31, uh, chapter 30 and 31, you can see it in 31, 28, where we read, Assemble to me all the elders of your tribes and all your officers, that I may speak these words in their ears and call heaven and earth to witness against them. And then the covenant sanctions in chapters 27 and 28 particularly is where we see these things enumerated and they're quite obvious. Uh, for example, uh, 27, 15, cursed to be the man who makes a carved or cast metal image, an abomination to the Lord, a thing by, made by the hands of a craftsman and sets it up in secret. And then all the people shall answer and say, Amen. The blessings are recounted at the beginning of chapter 28. Uh, you see that all the blessings come upon you and overtake you if you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Blessed you shall be in the city. Blessed you shall be in the field. Now, you, you can't get too rigid about imposing an outline structure like this on Deuteronomy. It arises out of that structure naturally. But it is helpful then to recognize the overall structure and to understand that in Deuteronomy, as well as really in the general structure of, of Scripture itself, we're dealing with the covenant instructions and stipulation of the king's people, of God the great king to us. God tells us who he is, tells us what he has done for us, what he requires of us, and then the blessings, cursings that we may realize as we are obedient to his commands. Now, I put all of this under the historical background to the book because the people of Israel, they're living in this environment, and I think they understand this covenant structure because that's the way the world operates in their mind. They understand that perhaps far better than I think we do. They inherently understood as a natural frame of reference for just the way their world operated, that the God who had declared himself to be their king and had rescued them from the enemy and had constituted them to be a nation holy to himself expected their obedience in return. So this is their guidebook um, not just for how do we get through the wilderness and what do we do as we enter the land of promise, but it was their guidebook for realizing the blessings of obedience in the land of promise. Well, how would we outline then the book of Deuteronomy? Well, I think the first four chapters are history. We could say this is the historical prologue. It's a review of God's faithfulness, the failure of Israel after they leave G Egypt and after they face God's judgment. Moses reminds them of their rebellion at Kadesh, uh, of several of the skirmishes that Israel is involved in and the way that God had delivered them from those things. And God had, had already given his people a lot of territory and Moses reviews this in this historical prologue section. He also reviews how the Lord was angry with him 
because of his own sin and how the Lord is going to forbid him to enter the land of promise. Instead, God tells Moses to charge Joshua with the task of leading the people of Israel. And then in chapter 4, he warns them to listen as they enter the land of promise, uh, to obey as they go on the mission uh, to the cities of Canaan. You shall not, uh, Deuteronomy 4, 2, you shall not add to the word that I command you, nor take from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you. And then he goes on to remind them, look, you saw what the Lord did when he visited judgment upon your fathers for their uh, disobedience, but you're alive today because you held fast to the Lord your God. Now, one of the things that we see in this section is a repeated refrain here, a strong emphasis on passing these laws down to your children. Deuteronomy has a very strong emphasis on the generational connection of God's promises. We see it in Deuteronomy 4, 9, only take care and keep your soul diligently, yes, lest you forget the things that your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. Make them known to your children and to your children's children. There's that covenant conveyance. Now, after the historical prologue, we see the second section, the stipulations, and that begins in chapter 5 and it extends all the way down to chapter 26. And the stipulations begin with a recitation or a repetition restatement of the Ten Commandments, chapter 5, and then a restatement of those commandments with a doctrinal emphasis. And this is where, in this second section, the beginning of it, that we find the Shema and what I think is one of the most significant sections of the book, We've touched on it already, he, and that is Deuteronomy 6, 6 through 9. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your head. They shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And again, there is this repeated emphasis on children throughout chapter 6. Throughout the, the general uh, section of application of the law, the holiness of the people is emphasized. They're set apart from the nations. They're chosen by God. They're loved by Him. They're blessed by Him. And interspersed with that, is the admonitions then, since I love you and I have blessed you, do not follow after the gods of Canaan. And then chapters 5 through 11 replete with various repetitions and warnings and rehearsals of Israel's past failure, the need for obedience. The episode of the uh, golden calf is recounted. Uh, the giving of the law uh, again in chapter 10. And what God requires of his people is not just mechanical obedience, but love for him, a heart that is righteous. Deuteronomy 10, 12 and 13. Now Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul, and to keep the commandments and statutes of the Lord your God, which I am commanding you today for your good. And just a few verses after this, we read of circumcision of the heart. That's what God's concerned with. Circumcision for Israel is not just a sign of their national identity as a people, but of their covenant fidelity, of their spiritual condition. So while there are some specific commands in chapters 5 through 11, it's mostly general statements that uh, God requires faithfulness. Chapters 12 through 26 then get into the specific laws, the civil, the ceremonial, the moral, all of them tied to the Ten Commandments. Chapters 12 through 16 deal with ceremonial duties, 
regarding feasts and fasts and to the place of worship, uh, listening to the voice of God and to faithful prophets, not the prophets that contradict His law. We read about clean and unclean foods, the sabbatical calendar, laws regarding slavery. And most of these are ceremonial laws, but mixed in there are civil and uh, or government governmental law like, like slavery, that's mixed in there. Chapter 16, uh, near the end after the feasts, we see this. Uh, chapter 25, primarily civil laws and duties regarding judges and land and soldiers and aliens who reside within your land, the uh, laws concerning the responsibility of the kings. And this is where we see in this section 12 through 26, this is where we see another aspect of that covenantal uh, preservation. The king was to write out a copy of the law for himself, and then he was to present it to the priests for approval. He was then supposed to continue reading it to the point where he knew it by heart and he kept it. That's covenant succession. We don't have a record of the kings ever doing that. There's only one true king who's going to do everything the law requires, and that's again where this points to, to Jesus. But they were supposed to convey this, write it down, memorize it, and keep it. And then continuing then on through chapter 26, we learn how the priests and Levites were to be provided for, how Moses is the great prophet and intercessor, and, and we learn about property boundaries, laws, concerning witnesses, um, property rights, cities of refuge, inheritance rights, miscellaneous laws like Deuteronomy 22.6. If you come across a bird's nest in any tree or on the ground with young ones or eggs and the mother sitting on the young or on the eggs, you shall not take the mother with the young. You shall let the mother go, but the young you may take for yourself, that it may go well with you and that may you, you may live long. Now, these are laws of mercy and laws of provision. Uh, don't sow your vineyard with two kinds of seeds. Don't plow with an ox and a donkey together. These are specifically laws governing Israel as a nation. And then the last section of the book, chapters 27 through 34, deals with Israel's future. And this is where you find the sanctions, uh, the blessings, the cursings. It's a fascinating section. Um, chapter 27, it gives us an example of this in verses 14 and 15. And the Levites shall declare to all the men of Israel in a loud voice, Cursed be the man who makes a carved or metal image, an abomination to the Lord, a thing made by the hands of a craftsman and sets it up in secret. Then all the people shall answer and say, uh, Amen. And on it would go. Uh, cursed be one who misleads the blind on the road. Cursed be one uh, who moves his, labor, his neighbor's landmark and, and so on. And then in chapter 28, you have the blessings. If you obey, God will bless you. He'll bless you with land, with prosperity, with livestock, with fruit, but more cursing. If you disobey, God will strike you with disease and pestilence and pursue you until you perish. It's actually a pretty violent chapter. It's a prophecy of Israel's exile and their return from exile. In 27, or 28, 47, and 48, you again see an example of this. Because you did not serve the Lord your God with joyfulness and gladness of heart, because of the abundance of all things, therefore you shall serve your enemies whom the Lord will send against you in hunger and thirst and nakedness and lacking everything. And he will put a yoke of iron on your neck until he has destroyed you. Uh, there's covenant sanctions. And then in chapter 30, the covenant is renewed and the people are challenged to obey. And it's quite a stirring sermon uh, that Moses gives them as he challenges them for the last time as they're about to cross over into the land of promise. Deuteronomy 30, 19 and 20. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life that your offspring may live loving the Lord your God, obeying His voice, holding fast to Him, for He is your life and length of days, that you may dwell in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to give to them. In the last section of the book then, chapters 31 to 34, we see Joshua taking Moses' place. And Joshua actually does it. He writes down the law and God's command to Joshua 
to be strong and courageous. Moses writes these things because he's going to be the one who will bring the people of Israel into the land. Then God would be with Joshua. Chapter 32 contains the song of Moses, the rock. His work is perfect and all his ways are justice. A wonderful hymn about the way in which the Lord had provided and will provide for his people and finally will vindicate them. And then the book closes with a blessing on each of the tribes and the death of Moses at the age of 120. We're told that God himself buries Moses in the land of Moab. Well, there are several verses that we could say are theme verses for the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, let's look at seven of them as kind of our way of, of walking through the book, if you will. In 4 5, we read, See, I have taught you decrees and laws as the Lord my God commanded me, so that you may follow them in the land you are entering to take possession of it. Deuteronomy 31, 6, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. The Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you or forsake you. Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed to us and to our children forever that we may follow all the words of this law. 10, 12, and now Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul? For one, now Israel, hear the decrees and laws that I'm about to teach you. Follow them so that you may live and go in and take possession of the land of the, land the Lord, the God of your ancestors is giving you. 10, 20, fear the Lord your God and serve him. Hold fast to him and take your oaths in his name. Uh, Deuteronomy 18, 15, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen, uh, that prophetic verse. And all of these verses, again, are key and they lead us kind of through the book and the themes and emphases uh, that we see throughout the book. But if we were to focus on one key verse that, again, I think encapsulates the message that we have here, I think it's Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5, the Shema, the, the word hear, Shema Israel. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. That carries us through uh, the entire book, even, of course, until today. Uh, the Shema becomes, for the people of Israel, a confession of faith. Uh, this is the means by which they would acknowledge the one true God and his commandments for them. When Jesus is asked about uh, which is the great commandment, he answers by quoting the Shema. So that I think is a key uh, verse for the book. What are some theological themes then in the book of Deuteronomy? Well, as we come to this book, we're gonna notice a repetition of some of the themes we've seen in other books. If the historical context is for God to review for his people, uh, their past and his mercy for them and to renew his covenant with this new generation, then the theological purpose of the book is to provide an exposition and application of what God requires of them, particularly through the Ten Commandments. So we're going to see the theological themes of the Ten Commandments and the law, the theme of Israel as God's nation, the theme of centralized worship, and then the theme of the land again. Now, the purposes of this book are very wide ranging, but perhaps the most straightforward way of understanding it is to see it then as an exposition of the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are given in chapter five, and Moses' major speech in Deuteronomy, which stretches from 444 to 2868, that long speech, that big sermon, is an exposition upon and an elaboration of the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. The moral law is expanded and it's applied 
although like the covenant structure of the book, it's, it's not a rigid outline that you impose on a book. But for example, in chapter 12, that's about tearing down the altars of pagan gods when they enter the land of Canaan. They shall not worship those gods. They shall not worship the true God the way the pagans worship the false gods. But there are general principles there as well. Uh, for example, in 12.8, you shall not do according to all that we are doing here today, everyone doing whatever is right in his own eyes. Uh, that phrase, everyone doing whatever is right in his own eyes, kind of becomes the theme of the book of Judges. And we can walk through each of the sections here where the Ten Commandments are expounded in Moses' speech in his sermon. But just another example would be the Fifth Commandment. Uh, that's expounded in 1618 through 1822. And here, there's no mention of parents. That's uh, the fifth commandment, honor your father and your mother, right? There's no mention of parents explicitly. But what that section, 1618 to 1822, what that section is doing is talking about authority structures, priests, judges, kings, impartiality in making judgments. Um, the provision that we saw of how every king was to sit and write for himself a copy of the law, the, uh, the refusing bribes um, by those in authority, advocating for justice. So, for example, we read in 16, 18 to 20, you shall appoint judges and officers. All of this has to do with authority, fifth commandment. You shall appoint judges and officers in all your towns that the Lord your God is giving you according to your tribes. And they shall judge the people with righteous judgment. You shall not pervert justice. You shall not show partiality. You shall not accept a bribe. For a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and subverts the cause of the righteous. Justice and only justice you shall follow that you may live and inherit the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Have you ever wondered how it is that the Westminster Larger Catechism can extrapolate so much from the simplicity of the Ten Commandments, what does God require of you in this commandment, then the, the book of Deuteronomy may give you the answer because this is where the Ten Commandments are extrapolated and the confession echoes a lot of this language. So altogether then, the laws that are given in the book of Deuteronomy, they're, they're more exhortations and they're less specifications. This is a sermon. And so in Leviticus and Numbers, you have specific detail, and you certainly do in Deuteronomy as well, but it is more of a sermon. It's the application of the law and how the people were to obey it. And so this is, for example, why the text of the commandments uh, number four and five and 10 in Deuteronomy, they differ from the commandments four, five, and 10 given in Exodus. In Exodus, the ground for the Sabbath day, the fourth commandment, is the seventh day rest of God at creation. In Deuteronomy, the ground for the fourth commandment is redemption from Egypt. In the Exodus, the blessing for obedience in the fifth commandment is living long in the land. In Deuteronomy, it expands that, living long that it may go well with you in the land. So what's Deuteronomy doing? It's applying the law in a way that recognizes the progress of the people toward the land as they prepare to enter it. Now, we should take just a little excursus here and recognize that Reformed theology has traditionally seen three types of laws in the Mosaic Code and beyond, uh, the moral, the ceremonial, and the civil. The Westminster Confession uh, makes that distinction in chapter 19 uh, that the moral law is summarized in the Ten Commandments. But it's not only the Ten Commandments. That's a summary. Besides that, there are ceremonial laws. They contain uh, typical ordinances prefiguring Christ, sacrifices, and, and so on. The ceremonial laws, the confession says, those laws that portray the salvation to come in Christ, are now abrogated under the New Testament. Now, that's a strong word, and it means that they are repealed, they are done away with. 
And then to the state of Israel as a body politic, God gave various judicial laws. That law which expired together with the estate of that people. Those civil laws no longer oblige us today, says the Confession, farther than the general equity thereof. So the Confession says that the civil law that ordered the nation of Israel, restrained sin in the nation, those civil laws, they expired. Uh, that is, they fulfilled their function. They were like a contract with an expiration date. They're done. But the moral law forever binds. Now, the challenge is, while that, that really is quite a neat and, and tidy distinction, the Bible itself rarely says this particular law is a civil law. Now this law, this law here is a ceremonial law, or this law is a moral one. You have to make that judgment. And often those types of laws are interspersed. So the law that we saw earlier about the bird is, is taking a bird along with her hatchlings. Is that a moral issue or is that a civil uh, issue? The confession makes allowance for the fact that the word doesn't make this threefold distinction a hard and fast thing with rigid categories. So for example, the confession of faith says that we commonly call the Ten Commandments the moral law. So it's a common understanding. It's a convention that we use, but it's not a rigid biblical distinction. The confession also says that the ceremonial law partly holds forth diverse instructions of moral duties. Somehow, uh, the ceremonial law is attached to the moral, which means that we need to be careful about the way that we want to try to, imply, to apply the entirety of the moral law uh, to society, for example. Um, Reformed theologian Francis Turretin noted that the Ten Commandments contain, even within them, ceremonial aspects. It's a moral code, but there are aspects of it which are intended for Israel alone, uh, such as land inheritance if you obey your parents. So perhaps understanding these three types of laws in, as divided into two uh, may be helpful. Some have, have done this. There is the moral law that's ongoing, and there is the typological. There are typological elements in the moral law. And again, the promise of land inheritance, if you obey your parents, that's a typological element contained within a moral law. So there's type in the moral. Israel was a theocratic kingdom, and as such, they were a prototype of the consummated eternal kingdom. So there's no earthly institution or political body that parallels Israel's condition. It's not the state, because it's not holy, and not even the church, because we are not a political uh, kingdom. The law then comes to fruition in Jesus Christ. The types will meet their reality in the church through Christ. We'll see this a little bit more when we get to that theme of land inheritance. The civil laws of the Old Testament no longer apply because they meet the reality in the type to which they point in Jesus Christ, who's leading his people to a new land and to a greater kingdom in the same way uh, that we no longer apply the, the ceremonial laws because they've met their type in Christ who fulfilled them. So the Ten Commandments provide for us the theme, really, in the book of Deuteronomy. They are expressed and then extrapolated out through the rest of the book. A second theological theme would be Israel as a distinct people of God called out by God's own initiative. There are a couple of verses here uh, that I think are helpful. Deuteronomy 32, 6. Do you thus repay the Lord, you foolish and senseless people? Is not he your father who created you, who made you and established you? Israel is uniquely as a people, a son of God. He is their father, uh, their birth of God 
if you will. Deuteronomy 4, 37 and 38, Because he loved your fathers and chose their offspring after them and brought you out of Egypt with his own presence by his great power, driving out before you nations greater and mightier than you to bring you in to give you their land for inheritance as it is this day. God loved the fathers of Israel and becomes their father. 7, 6, you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. And Moses goes on to say in verses 7 and 8, it wasn't because you were more in number than those people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you. For you are the fewest of them, but it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Israel as a people of God. Israel as that people is supposed to be a model then of the kingdom of God on earth, a model that serves as a testimony to the nations surrounding her. And as such, Israel is given a mission, the mission to keep the commandments of God then as a testimony to those nations. You see it in Deuteronomy 4, 5 through 8. See, I have taught you statutes and rules as the Lord my God commanded me that you should do them in the land that you're entering to take possession of it. Keep them and do them for that will be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who when they hear all these statutes will say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us? whenever we call upon him. And what great nation is there that has statutes and rules so righteous as all this law that I set before you today? You see, Israel as a people was to be a model of the victory of God's kingdom as she possesses the land in the next stage of the fulfillment of the promise that God made to Abraham. In Deuteronomy 21, or 29, 13, uh, the entire nation stands before the Lord to enter into covenant with him that he may establish you today as his people, that he may be your God as he promised you and as he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. So as Abraham was called out by God, so the people are elect of God. They are a testimony to his faithfulness, his provision, the fact that he keeps his promises. They're unique also in that they are a theocracy. They are under the direct rule of God. In Deuteronomy 17, God makes provision for the people to set a human king over themselves when they come into the land, but that king would be chosen by God. So Israel as a nation is seen in the gathering of God's people. When the people of Israel gathered to hear God's law, they gathered uniquely as an assembly of the people of God. And you see that spoken of several times in Deuteronomy. For example, in 9.10, when Moses says, The Lord gave me two tablets of stone written with the finger of God, and on them were all the words that the Lord had spoken with you on the mountain out of the midst of the fire on the day of assembly. The assembling of the people was the assembling of a people for God. And that congregation, of course, was often unfaithful to God. They didn't worship Him the way that they were supposed to worship Him. They didn't conquer the land. They were not obedient to the covenant stipulations. So they would realize the covenant sanctions, the cursings enumerated throughout the book, particularly in the 27th and 28th chapter. They'd be exiled from the land. And we see that particular sanction in Deuteronomy 4, 25 through 28. If you act corruptly by doing what is evil in the sight of the Lord your God so as to provoke him to anger, you will soon utterly perish from the land that you are going over the Jordan to possess. You will not live long in it, but will be utterly destroyed. And the Lord will scatter you among the peoples and you will be left few in number among the nations where the Lord will drive you. And that's exactly, of course, what happens as we can see unfold in the remainder of the Old Testament. The people rebel. The people rebel, but God preserves a remnant for himself. 
a remnant into which the nations are brought. God expands, in spite of their disobedience, He expands the borders of Israel to go beyond Canaan and to wage a spiritual warfare by which the gospel conquers a people from every tongue, tribe, language, and nation. Where in Deuteronomy 7, 6, God calls Israel a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples on the earth. In Titus, he refers to a people for his own possession, a people not of the earth, but yet called from all the nations of the earth, just as he said in Deuteronomy. What Israel was to be, the church accomplishes in the victory of the Great Commission as it conquers the nations not with weapons of warfare that are, that are physical, of the flesh, but of the spirit. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verses 4 through 6, Paul says this, The weapons of our warfare are not the flesh, but we have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. Our weapons are not of the flesh, but of the Spirit, taking every thought captive to obey Christ. So, while Israel is to expel the wicked nations from the land, they themselves end up being expelled because of their wickedness. But the land will be inherited by a remnant of the people of God called out from every nation. James 2.5, listen, my beloved brothers, he has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him. This inheritance is obtained through the Spirit and is far greater than the typological inheritance of Canaan, but the inheritance of a new creation. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, And him also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Colossians 1 and verse 12 refers to it as the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. And then when we get to the book of Revelation, we see that inheritance come to fruition. No longer, Revelation 22, 3 through 5, no longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and His servants will worship Him. They will see His face, and His name will be on their foreheads, and, no, and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. So that's the theological theme of Israel as a nation pointing to the people that God is gathering for himself in Christ. The third theme we will look at here in Deuteronomy is the theme of centralized worship. There's one God and there's one sanctuary. You see that in many places like Deuteronomy 12, 5, the Lord chooses the place to put his habitation and makes his habitation there. There is where you shall go to worship him. And the cities that comprised uh, Canaan would, of course, have in many cases in those cities, they'd each have their own gods, their own patron gods that would be worshipped. Uh, each deity in each city would have a temple or temples that would be constructed in their honor. But the worship of the one true God would take place in the one true place. Now, Israel would fail at this as they fail in the rest of the law, and they would build altars in many places, and they would build many high places. And the faithfulness of the kings of Israel, we'll see this when we get to the historical books, the faithfulness of a king of Israel could be determined by whether they were building altars in places where they shouldn't be, or whether they were tearing down altars in the places where they shouldn't be. In fact, when we get there, we're going to find in the historical books that the fate of the temple is the fate of the people. The fate of the temple is the fate of Israel itself. Now, in Deuteronomy, this doesn't necessarily mean one geographical location yet, like Jerusalem, because the temple isn't built. The tabernacle is a mobile thing. Worship is centered around the tabernacle where the ark is located. You fast forward then to the New Testament worship and we find that when Christ 
comes, Emmanuel, God with us, when he ascends then into heaven, he sends his Holy Spirit to dwell with us, God with us, the church becomes the dwelling place of God. The church becomes the temple, the central place of worship. And just like the nation expands, so does the temple. Notice what happens in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 9. Paul says, you are God's field. You are God's building. Now, when you first read this, you might think, oh, Paul's mixing his metaphors um, down there. But no, he's not confused. And Paul's not just throwing out word pictures. He's completing the picture of the temple. Those two things are related, the field and the building. And it's all leading to this point in 1 Corinthians 3, 17. You are the temple, a plural, the church. Paul's using word pictures out of a garden and a building. Think Garden of Eden, dwelling temple of God, building, tabernacle, temple, mirrors the garden as well. Paul's using word pictures of that garden and building that describe the church of Jesus Christ as the very dwelling place of God. Remember that garden was a temple. It was the place where God meets with Adam. Adam and Eve were to tend and keep it. And if you remember from back in Genesis, those words tend and keep were metaphors for worship. Cultivating the field was the means by which Adam and Eve would be fruitful and multiply, and the garden temple then was to spread all over the globe. Adam fails, he's expelled. Temple, tabernacle eventually will be built, and it would have many features that mirror the garden. Vegetation, vines, pomegranates, uh, vines, grapes, things that are engraved into the gates and ornamentation of the building. So the word picture that Paul's using is drawn right out of that, linked to the Garden of Eden and to the altar and to the tabernacle, to the temple of the Old Testament. Just as the temple is a picture of a garden, cultivated growing field, Paul uses that imagery then to describe the church as a garden, as a building. So he says, in verse 12, 1 Corinthians 3, that we build with gold, silver, and precious stones. Now, the only other place in the Bible where you read about gold, silver, and precious stones being put into a building is the building of the temple. And Paul says, I'm a builder. I'm a wise master builder. And in doing so, he creates a link between himself then and the builders of the tabernacle. So what Paul's doing here in 1 Corinthians 3, 9 is, again, he's not mixing metaphors. What's he's doing? He's, he's building with metaphor. He wants you to see what he's driving at in verse 17 then, 1 Corinthians 3, 17. You are that temple. The church is that temple. And many theologians have traced the, uh, the significance of this that we're just merely reviewing here. But Paul says, do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him, for God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. Paul is saying that the church of Jesus Christ is the spiritual building of which the Old Testament tabernacle and temple was merely a picture. That in the church of Jesus Christ, the dwelling place of God with man, it graduates. And it graduates from a material type that is built with perishable stuff that in the end will melt into the spiritual reality of a dwelling place for God with man. And this dwelling of God with man is the indwelling of the Spirit of God, who is at the same time the Spirit of Christ, who at the same time indwells us. So the very best that earth can represent, things like gold and silver and, and precious stones are eclipsed by spiritual, the living vitality of the church, because the church is living and the church is conquering. The church will never be destroyed. The church will be triumphant. And that's why Peter would go on to say, you are living stones, as we uh, looked at a bit earlier, being built up into a spiritual house. Peter says that's in fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy.
First Peter 2, 6, quoting from Isaiah 28, he says, For it stands in Scripture, behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Centralized worship is a picture then, God dwelling with his people in this place, a picture of God dwelling with his people in his church. And then the last theological theme we'll look at here in Deuteronomy is the picture of the land. We've already anticipated that, but the phrase the land or a land is used over 130 times in the book of Deuteronomy. Another prominent word that you find in Deuteronomy is the word possession. And not all of those references are to the land of promise particularly, but certainly a major theme from the first chapter in which God reviews the gift of the land that the people refused to take out of fear to the repeated reminder that Moses dies in the land of Moab. The book of Deuteronomy is primarily about how God's people are to conduct themselves when they reach the promised land. Deuteronomy 6.10, when the Lord your God brings you into the land that he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give you with great and good cities, to give you with great and good cities that uh, you did not build, then take care lest you forget the Lord. Upon the promise that is given to Abraham, Genesis 12, 7, the Israelites were supposed to go in and take Canaan, but they don't. God has promised that if she's unfaithful, you won't stay in the land, and they don't. That's part of the sanctions that we saw earlier. You see them again in Deuteronomy 28, 58 through 63. If you're not careful to do all the words of this law that are written in the book, then the Lord will bring on you and on your offspring extraordinary afflictions, and you will be plucked off of the land that you are entering to take possession of it. And we see, and, and, and that is something that not only do we see in the book of Deuteronomy, but we see it elsewhere. Proverbs chapter 2, the upright will live in the land, but the ungodly will be cut off from the land. And that theological theme then of the land is carried through the Bible as kings and chronicles and prophets. They, they show the rebellion of God's people and the eventual expulsion from the land. And it's not until we come to the New Testament, in fact, when you move through the Old Testament, through those kings and prophets, it, it becomes uh, more desperate, if you will. We can't get that land. We can't inherit that land. It points us forward ultimately. Only Jesus secures the land for his people. It points to the work of Christ who teaches the meek will inherit the earth. And then when we hear uh, Paul say in Galatians 3.16 that the promise made to Abraham and to his descendants that he would be heir of the world, that didn't come through the law, but it came through the righteousness of faith. We learn that the promise to Abraham is ultimately the promise that is made to Christ. The land promised to Abraham and Israel is fulfilled through the obedience of Christ. And the land promise is an eternal inheritance, part of uh, which is secured in our participation in Christ's kingdom. Now, we've already then anticipated how Christ is seen then in the book of Deuteronomy and how he is central. And once again, we can only touch upon the ways in which Christ is the center of Deuteronomy. As the last book of the Pentateuch, um, some of these themes we've touched on before because they're constant themes uh, throughout the Pentateuch, Passover, sacrificial system as a whole, types and shadows, the land inheritance, the promise that expands to the Gentiles. But once again, let's look again at how Moses is prefiguring Christ in a particular aspect here in Deuteronomy. We'll see the law, particularly the curse of the law this time. And we will see Israel as it points forward. And then we'll finish by looking at the voice of Judah. So Christ at the center of Deuteronomy as we look at Moses. And that's probably the most recognizable picture in Deuteronomy is that of Moses. We see that in one of our key verses in Deuteronomy 18, 15, and 16. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen, just as you desired of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly, when you said, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God or see this great fire anymore, lest I die. 
oh, you might read this verse and think, well, the Lord your God will raise up a prophet like me. Well, it must be talking about Joshua here in Deuteronomy 18. But notice at the end of Deuteronomy what it says, after the death of Moses. Somebody adds this. There has not arisen a prophet since in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face, none like him for all the signs and wonders that the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt, to Pharaoh and his servants in the land, for all the mighty power and the great deeds of terror that Moses did in the sight of all Israel. Joshua doesn't fit the bill. He didn't do those things. It's not until we get to the New Testament and, and preaching to the people as they gather around Solomon's portico, the, the eastern wall of Herod's court, the court of the, the Gentiles, that Peter says this in Acts chapter 3, Moses said, the Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. You shall listen to him and whatever he tells you. And it shall be that every soul who does not listen to that prophet shall be destroyed from the people. And all that the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and those who came after him also proclaimed these days, you are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant that God made with your fathers, saying to Abraham, and in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. God, having raised up his servant, sent him to you first to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. Acts chapter 3, verses 22 to 26. Who's he talking about? Who's he preaching about? Jesus Christ. And of course, we see that when Christ comes, he's doing the signs and the wonders that Moses did in the book of Deuteronomy. We see a similar theme in Acts chapter 7, Stephen's sermon. He, he quotes the same text. Moses saying that God will raise up a prophet like me from your brothers. And Stephen goes on to say, this is Christ. And there are numerous parallels then between Moses and Christ. And some of these we've explored before, such as Moses being the servant of the house and Christ being the son of the house. Moses leading people to the land of promise, even as Christ goes to prepare a place for us. Moses' intercession, his willingness to die for the people. But this anticipation of a greater prophet is the dominant one in Deuteronomy. Christ is not only a prophet revealing the will of God to us, but he's the word who perfectly fulfills the will of God for us. So we see Moses as a picture of Jesus. Every exorcism, every miracle, Jesus is doing the works of Moses and showing himself to be that prophet prophesied in Deuteronomy. Christ is also seen as the center of Deuteronomy in the law. And here I want to concentrate particularly on the curse. We've seen how the law points to Christ and it's fulfilled by him. We sometimes refer to the three uses of the law. Its first function uh, to show the perfect holiness of God. And that, of course, highlights the sinfulness of man. And so it shows the need for a savior. The second function or use was to restrain sin. The third use to show us how we can please God. And as to the first use, the law highlights sin because it shows us that they, they couldn't keep it. The Jewish person couldn't keep it. We can't keep it. The law propel, propels them to the Messiah. It shows them they need him, the one who would keep the law. And in the meantime, it restrains sin, the second use of the law. But the law shows us the desperate need for Jesus. Galatians 3.24, the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. Paul says in Romans 3 that through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Jesus says in Matthew 5.17, I've come to fulfill the law, not to do away with it, but to do it. He does what we can't do. It leads us to Jesus who does what we can't do. And since the law can't provide life, the law can only judge the law breaker, Christ keeps the law and then provides the life. He pays its penalty for us so that the Apostle Paul can say this in Romans 8, there is therefore now no condemnation, good news, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Jesus Christ from the law 
of sin and death. Now, that's remarkable. And what's remarkable about it is this. Deuteronomy prescribes the death penalty for the lawbreaker, the perpetual rebellious lawbreaker. Deuteronomy 21 tells us, if a man has a stubborn and rebellious son who refuses to listen, then he should be brought before the elders of the city. And if he is indeed to be found guilty, then all the men of the city shall stone him to death with stones, and you will purge the evil from your midst, and all Israel shall hear and fear. A violent death. That's the curse of the law. Deuteronomy 21, 22 and 23, if a man has committed a crime punishable by death and he's put to death and you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain all night in the tree, but you shall bury him the same day for a hanged man is cursed by God. You shall not defile your land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance. But in Galatians chapter 3, verses 12 and 13, we read, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Jesus Christ is, is put to death at the hand of the civil authorities. He displays the suffering of the innocent at the hands of the guilty. Rebellion demanded the death penalty. Who's going to pay it? Paul tells us that Jesus Christ accepts God's judgment upon the guilty. He is lifted up on the cross. He is cursed as one hanging on a tree. He becomes a curse for us, the embodiment of our judgment. He bore the judgment of death because he bore the guilt of our sin. And so as the rebellious was stoned with stones, Christ was smitten of God and afflicted because the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. God made him to be sin, who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Jesus spoke of his being lifted up to glory as beginning with his being lifted up on the cross and bearing its curse. John 12, 32, when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to myself. In Romans chapter 10 and verse 4, we read that Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. So the law then is transformed to be the law of Christ. And so the law is for us then, third use of the law, or the third function of the law, a rule to tell us how to glorify God through good works. As chapter 26 of the Westminster Confession tells us, good works done in obedience to God's commands are the fruits and evidences of a true and lively faith. Faith in what? Faith in Christ. Christ is as faith in Him as, as our good works proceed wholly from the Spirit of Christ not from ourselves, not from our understanding of the law, and not from the law, but from Christ himself. We don't understand the law or look at the law apart from Jesus. Now, that certainly doesn't mean we ignore the law, right? It certainly doesn't mean that it has no bearing on us. Of course not. No, it means that we recognize that it can't provide salvation for us. So we see it not merely as law, not as the law of death, as Paul calls it, but as the law of Christ. Paul refers to it uh, that way twice, particularly in Galatians. Here's a summary of the law, by the way. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, your neighbor as yourself. How is that exhibited? Galatians 3 or Galatians 6, 2. Bear one another's burdens. So fulfill the law of Christ. Galatians 5, 14. The whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. What's Paul doing? Well, obviously he's summarizing what Jesus himself said in Matthew 22, the summary of the law taken from Exodus. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind. That's the first and great commandment. And the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. That's the two tables of the law. Israel as a people and nation then also points us to Christ. And I'm going to say it in this particular way. And as to go back to Deuteronomy chapter 6, our key verse, the Shema, uh, the words, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Jesus is the Messiah. He is the one. 
He is the anointed one of God, God incarnate. When Jesus says, in John chapter 10 and verse 30 and in other passages, when Jesus says, I and the Father are one. Now that is a complex and beautiful statement of theology. But understand in light of the Shema, hear O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Understand that to the Jew, when Jesus says that, I and the Father are one. The Jew understands that instantly as a direct claim to divinity, and it's based on their confession of faith. You see what Jesus is doing? He's going right to the heart of Israel's faith. But Israel is faithless. And so Jesus succeeds where Israel fails. And that is perhaps most dramatically demonstrated in Christ's defeat of Satan after 40 days in the wilderness. That same parallel that we saw in the book of Numbers, Israel fails to live according to the word of the law, but Jesus quotes Deuteronomy at numerous points, and he would live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And he quotes Deuteronomy, not just because those are good verses with which to defeat Satan, although they are, but he quotes Deuteronomy to show that he has succeeded where Israel failed, that he is perfectly obedient where Israel is not. You see, Israel was uniquely the Son of God. We see that in Deuteronomy 32, 6. Is he not your father who created you? Israel is seen as the Son of God. In Deuteronomy 33, 17, Israel is referred to as a firstborn bull who has majesty, who will gore the people to the ends of the earth. Israel has a mission as the father, their father, had given them. They have a mission as a son of God. And that's a concept then that's frequently attested to in Scripture. We see it in Exodus chapter 4 and verse 22 when Moses is to tell Pharaoh, Israel is my firstborn son. Let my son go that he may serve me. We see it in the prophets, Hosea chapter 11 and verse 1. When Israel was a child, I loved him. Out of Egypt, I have called my son. Israel seen as the son of God, just like Adam was as he's created in God's image. And then Adam bears a son after his own image. Adam fails. Israel fails. Jesus comes as the true Son of God, the true Adam, the true Israel, who achieves victory over the kingdom of Satan. He guards and keeps God's temple. He leads his people with faithfulness. So that when we come to the New Testament then, our initial introduction to the Messiah, this is even before the Messiah is born. In fact, it's even before the Messiah is conceived. The message of the angel to Mary is that the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. The wilderness temptation then, the direct picture built upon Israel's experience as a son of God in the wilderness and Satan's assault on that paradigm, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become bread. If you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here, Luke 4, 9. The testimony of John is that this is the Son of God, John 1, 34. The testimony of the Father is that this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased, Matthew 3, 17. In Matthew 2, we, we see that direct correspondence with Israel as Joseph takes the family to Egypt, Matthew 2, 15 and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Out of Egypt, I called my son, Hosea 11.1, 1, the reference. And one more uh, reference I think will be helpful here. Although it doesn't appear in Deuteronomy, it, it gives us, it shows us that direct correspondence. And that is that Hosea reference in Hosea 1.10. It says, yet the number of the children of Israel shall be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. And in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, 
it shall be said to them, children of the living God. And then when we come to Matthew 16, Jesus asks that most crucial question that we all must answer. Matthew 15, 16, 15 and 16, he said to them, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. As Greg Beale uh, suggests in his wonderful New Testament biblical theology, that this may be a conscious intention on Peter's part to draw upon the passage from Hosea to show that Jesus is the Messianic Son, leading the sons of Israel whom he represents. Now, like every other theme we've touched on, it's a significant topic. It's got deep implications to it. But suffice it to say this, it is because Jesus is the true Son of God, obedient to the will of his Father, that we, we also, being united to him by his Spirit, that we also may be called sons of God. Romans 8, 14, all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. And Jesus, Hebrews tells us, our brother. Well, let's finally then consider Christ the center, seen in the voice of Judah. As we conclude Deuteronomy, I want to connect the end of the Pentateuch with the beginning. I want to connect Deuteronomy with Genesis. On the seventh day, after creation, God enthrones himself as king. Creation falls. God is no less king. And all throughout the Pentateuch, there are these undercurrents of a prophetic hope that a king will come then and usher in a new creation. And this is a hope that will gather steam in the prophets. We, we might say that in the Pentateuch, Christ is most clearly anticipated as priest and in the historical books, most clearly anticipated as king and prophetic books as prophet. But none of these aspects is ever missing from any section of the Old Testament, prophet, priest, or king. And as the first book of the Pentateuch opens up with the enthronement of a king, the fifth book of the Pentateuch concludes with the expectation of a king. You may remember back in Genesis, the prophecy of Jacob from Genesis 49.10, that the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until tribute comes to him, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. This is a messianic prophecy. And now, at the very end of Deuteronomy, right before his death, Moses blesses the people of Israel. Now, this blessing comes immediately after the prophecy of Israel's disobedience and judgment they are going to need to be saved. And in chapter 33, he blesses the people. When Moses blesses the people in chapter 33, his blessings, they parallel the blessings that Jacob gives to his children, his sons, the 12 tribes in Genesis 49. Moses echoes that language. In Deuteronomy 33, 5, he declares, The Lord has made himself king over the tribes of Israel. And thus the Lord became king in Yeshurun when the heads of the people were gathered, all the tribes of Israel together. And then after he gives the blessing to Reuben, Moses gives this blessing to Judah. Hear, O Lord, the voice of Judah. Bring him into his people. With your hands contend for him and be a help against his adversaries. So in Genesis, Jacob prophesies the scepter will not depart from Judah. In Deuteronomy, Moses asks the Lord to hear Judah's voice. You see, what happens to Judah? God created man to rule and have dominion over the earth, but he fails. Judah also fails in her dominion. She's dominated by enemies. 
She's dominated until she's finally taken captive. She's exiled from Israel or from Canaan as Adam was exiled from the garden. In fact, we read this in Ezekiel 21, 27, a ruin, a ruin, I will make it. This also shall not be until he comes, the one to whom judgment belongs, and I will give it to him. In Ezekiel, 20, in Ezekiel 21, uh, verse 26, right before this, Ezekiel says, One is coming whose right it is to wear the crown, the scepter, the governmental authority. It will remain in the tribe of Judah until the one comes to whom it belongs. Amos chapter 9, I will restore God, I will restore David's fallen tent. I will repair its broken places, restore its ruins, and build it as it used to be. Isaiah chapter 11, a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit, and the Spirit of the Lord will rest on him. A verse that anticipates a second Adam, a son of David, of the tribe of Judah. So in Deuteronomy, Moses prophesies that Judah will cry out to God and that he will need to be brought back to Israel. A deliverer is going to come and rescue Judah. Who is that deliverer? He's the scepter of Judah. Judah will need to be brought to his people, and this will be accomplished by the one who bears that scepter. We saw this expectation back in the book of Numbers and in Balaam's prophecy, Numbers 24, 17, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. It shall crush the forehead of Moab and break down all the sons of Sheth. What we see in Deuteronomy 33, 7 is then a prayer on Judah's behalf. Hear, O Lord, the voice of Judah. It's a plea that the Lord would hear then Judah's prayer. What is the prayer? It can be nothing other than that the Lord would bring his Messiah to his people and fulfill Jacob's prophecy that a king would come who would rule and defend us and restrain and conquer his and our enemies. You see, the, the climax of the book of Deuteronomy is the prophecy of a messianic king who will deliver his people and lead them to conclusive victory in a glorious land. It is the hope of a new creation. And so the Pentateuch ends the way that it began. It begins with the enthronement of a king over his glorious creation, and it ends with the anticipation of the enthronement of a king over a new creation. The Pentateuch ends by Deuteronomy once again showing us that Christ is the center.